morning good morning we greet you in the name of jesus who is the christ those of you on the phone we have muted you and we are glad that you're here with us amen and those of you who are online if you are able to please type your name in and let me know that you are here this is the day that the lord has made and by his grace we will rejoice and be glad in it so glad to see those who are signing on we're also on the conference call for those who cannot come on if those of you who are online you know someone who can't come on they can call into the conference number 351-999-3300 Amen, amen, amen. We will start at 10 a.m. 10 a.m. Morning, morning, morning. Good morning. Good morning, people are signing on. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> good morning, good morning. I understand that we had Sunday school this morning. I was not able to get online this morning for Sunday school, but I'm sure that it was an awesome uh, time together in the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Well, it is 10 a.m., and we greet you this morning in the name that's above every other name, and that's the name of Jesus, who is the Christ. I want to take this opportunity to thank you for joining us on this third Sunday in May. And I pray that you are continuing to live by faith, to live by faith as we navigate this pandemic with wisdom and power and might. Thank you for joining in, my brothers and sisters of the Union Church and our friends for joining in on our Monday, Wednesday and Friday prayer calls. We also want to thank you for joining in and connecting with the Union Church on the uh, Union Team Connect and the Union Kids Connect. The Union Team Connect on Zoom every Thursday at 530 and the Teens Connect, and well the Kids rather connect on Zoom every Saturday at 11 a.m. I want to thank you and the teams that keep those going and also want to thank the Sunday School Superintendent, uh, Deaconess Juanita Edwards and Reverend T. Lewis Steele for facilitating our first virtual Sunday School today. I want to thank you for your diligence in serving the Lord and making Christ known. Let us continue to pray for one another. I pray for our nation and the entire world that uh, the Lord will accomplish his divine will in this pandemic and he, that he will bring this pandemic to an end. I thank God that he is keeping us and he is strengthening us in this time, amen. It's been an extremely rough week for me. However, the Lord is keeping me and my family as best as he desires to do so. And I'm just trying to stay in line with his will. I can continue to solicit your prayers and your, and your, and uh, lifting us up as we continue to lift you up in the Lord. This morning, I got some special guests. Some of you, I invited the Victory Mass Choir 
to be with us this morning, but you will not be able to see them. You will not be able to see them due to our uh, adherence to social distancing. So we're going to invite now the Victory Mass Choir to share with us. Clap your hands even in your home. Thank you, Victory Mass, for blessing us this morning. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father and our God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this great day. For surely this is the day that you have made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in this day. We thank you, Lord, that you are God, uh, not only the God of our salvation, but you are a good keeping God. Thank you for your mercy and your grace that keeps us and sustains us by the power of your word. Now, God, as we gather virtually at your feet, we pray that you would feed us with manna that will strengthen us and empower us to serve you in a way that pleases you and brings others to you. Thank you, Lord, for this great opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I hope you enjoyed my surprise of the Victory Mass Choir this morning. Uh, they came and they just blessed my heart. And I wanted to share that blessing with you. Uh, this morning, uh, I'm going to do something a little different. You notice that I'm in my home today. I'm not in the church um, due to circumstances beyond my control. Um, it was best for me to be here and share with you this morning. Um, we're praying um, that you are following us in our Bible studies. Praying that you are following us in our Bible study on Wednesday on Facebook Live and YouTube Live. I'm praying that you're following us as we are now talking about the power of the Christian mind. And this morning, um, though I'm in my home, I pray that the word of God is as powerful and effective and appetizing to you as it would be if I was sitting, seating or standing in the church. I want to do something a little different this morning. And what I want to do this morning is more of a teaching than a preaching. Every now and then, we just need to pull our chairs up to God's table and let him spoon feed us um, in, the, in, the, in teaching. So I want to teach a little bit this morning. If a preach come out, just say amen, hallelujah, or preach anyhow, pastor, Amen. But if you edge me on, it might I might kick up a leg or something. But I do want to talk to you this morning around the topic of the power of the Christian mind. 
It's a series that we have begun. And today my text is going to be out of the book of Romans, chapter 12. And I want to look at verse 2. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. I want to read the King James Version, the one in which we are familiar with, that we are most familiar with, the King James Version, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, where it says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. But then I want to also read to you out of the Amplified Bible, we find these words and do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes so that you may prove for yourselves what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and purpose for you. Again, we're talking about the power of the Christian mind. My brothers and my sisters, it is no secret that the power of the mind is awesome. The mind, the mind is the control center of our character, conduct, and our conversation. And our Bible, the Holy Bible, has much to say about our mind. From the onset, I want to make this disclaimer. It is difficult, the scholars agree, it is difficult to come up with precise definitions of words like heart and mind used in the scriptures uh, to refer to the immaterial nature of man. However, we can safely say that the mind is the fountain and the seat of all thoughts, passions, desires, affections, appetites, purposes, and endeavor. The mind, that faculty within man whereby he imagines and thinks and intends and understands. To be sure, my brothers and sisters, there is a wide variety of Hebrew and Greek words translated the mind in our English Bible, often overlapping with the biblical use of the word or term heart and similar words. And the term heart in scripture is more often than not interchangeable with the English word mind we use in scripture. Both heart and mind in the word of God call attention to man's inner being, the inner man, the inner man that controls self, who I am, that soul, the inner man, that center, that essence, the inner substance of man, that part of our being that must be redeemed, that must be reconciled to God, that must be renewed. Yes, the power of the mind is awesome. So much so that the body of Christ must no longer neglect its critical importance to our walk with Christ. Thus, I've dedicated this portion of the year to share with the Union family and with others a series of sermons and studies that I've entitled The Power of the Christian Mind. As a church family, We've already discussed in depth that we are saved not simply to escape hell and to reside in heaven, but God's desire is that we become Christ-like. The work of the, in, of the indwelling Holy Spirit and the goal of our sanctification is Christ-likeness. Yes, you and I who are washed in his blood, born of his spirit, justified by faith, are to become like Christ. We know that text, that text in Romans chapter 8, verse 28 and 29, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are 
called according, the called according to his purpose. Verse 29 says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he, the son, might be the firstborn among many brethren, that's you and I. The goal of our Bible study, the goal of our personal devotion, the goal of our self-denial, the goal of our submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, the goal of our being filled and controlled by the Holy Spirit is that you is that you and I, my brothers and sisters, become like Christ. I often remind our church uh, this over and over and over because there is a dangerous misunderstanding of what it means to be a Christian permeating the land, a disciple of Christ, what it means, what it is. Some have confused being well-behaved church folk with being followers of Christ. Some have confused uh, being fans of Christ with being followers of Christ. And we must be very careful not to confuse church accepted behavior with true Christ likeness. Christ likeness, Christ likeness to become like Christ. Christ likeness that is brought on only by transformation. And transformation is only achieved by the renewal of the mind. Transformation into Christ likeness is only achieved by renewal of the mind. And that renewal of the mind must become the mind of Christ. When you come to Christ and when you receive him as your Lord and Savior, according to the word of God, you are a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. According to the word of God, God, the Holy Spirit lives within you, 1 Corinthians 3, 16. You are a true child of God, Romans 8, 15 and Galatians 4, 6. You are a royal priesthood and holy nation, a people belonging to God, 1 Peter 2 and 9. When we come to Christ and receive him as your savior, you're complete in Christ, Colossians 2, 10. You've been chosen and appointed and empowered to bear good fruit. John 15 and 16, when you come to Christ and you know him as your personal Lord and Savior and you're born from above, you have been given everything for life and godliness. Second Peter 1, 3, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the earth. But here it is, while we may accept all that the word of God says about us, how, how? How do I live that out? Our text, Romans 12, 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. The mind is a powerful thing that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. If my life, if your life, is to be transformed, then our minds must be renewed. A renewed mind, a renewed mind is one that is synchronized with, meshed with, uh, submitted to the mind of Christ. I become Christ-like when I have the mindset of Christ himself. Romans 12, 2 provides two steps that must be taken. Two steps that must be taken in Romans 12, 2. The first one is, be not conformed to this world. Be not conformed to this world. Be not conformed to this world. Conformed is not a word that we use normally. I don't normally use it on a daily basis unless I'm referring to the scriptures. Um, But the word conform in this Bible, in this text, means to fashion or to shape. The literal meaning means to mold. In other words, we are not to allow the world 
to mold our thinking. We who are blood bought and blood washed, we must not allow the world to influence or mold our thinking. You see, the world's mindset is vastly different from that which God desires us to have. We are to be kingdom minded. We are to have the mind of Christ. Let me give you an example of the world's way of thinking. The world's way of thinking is you, you mature and you become independent. But the kingdom mind, the kingdom lifestyle, the life of the child of the king is as I mature, I become more dependent on God. The mindset of the world contaminates the mind and the child of God becomes weak in their devotion to God, worldly in their desires and wrong in their decisions. When we allow the world to govern our mind, we 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 we're not what God, and we're not becoming what God wants us to be. When we continue to allow the world to govern our thought life, we forfeit critical pillars of Christ likeness, critical privileges of Christ likeness. One. When the world governs our minds, when our minds are influenced by the world and it conforms and molds us into its, 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 its fleeting image, then we become confused regarding our identity. So we try, we do our best to fit in with people and 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 find out what looks right and 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 try to and try to mesh and become chameleons. And God never intended us to be that way. God gave us our identity, not only while we were in our mother's womb, but the Bible even teaches before the foundation of the world. So we can't forfeit that pillar and that privilege of being a child of God into wondering, wondering who I am in Christ. The second privilege, the second uh, uh, pillar that we forfeit when we allow the world to influence our thinking when we allow the world to mold our mindset is we are uncertain of our purpose in life. A man or woman of God is completely released when they understand and walk in their God given purpose. You have a reason for waking up in the morning. You have a, a standard of measurement of your fruitfulness, effectiveness, and your growth. When you don't know that you are an arm and you try to be a leg, you live your life in existence rather than in abundance because you're not being and living out the purpose that God has intended for you. Romans 12 tells us that, that when we know, when we have the mind of Christ, when our minds are renewed, this is when we know the perfect, good, and acceptable will of God. And that is the perfect, good, and acceptable will of God concerning your purpose, concerning my purpose. Why did God allow me to be born in the time that I was born, to the family in which I was born, in the geographical location in which I was born? Why did God allow me to be born with the ethnicity that I have? Those are questions that if we're going to live fruitfully, effectively, and in true liberty with Christ, we need to know. But we cannot, the world cannot reveal that to us. The world cannot be the one who molds us and shapes us into our identity and or our purpose. But the third pillar, the third pillar here that, that we forfeit when we allow the world to mold and shape our thinking is this. We have a limited sense of significance. We have a limited sense of significance. And we were created, my brothers and sisters, and washed in his blood and, and born again and born of his spirit, not simply to be ineffective and insignificant, but we are 
you are very significant to the will and purpose of God our Father. Your life is significant. You've been given gifts and talents. You've been given, you've been given a purpose and a task, and you are critically significant. But the only way in which we understand our significance and the only way in which we embrace our significance is to have the mind of Christ. Why? Because a proverbial writer says, as a man thinketh, so is he. As a man thinketh, so is he. If the world shapes our thinking, then we will be worldly in our living and worldly in our behavior and ultimately unpleasing, excuse me, unpleasing to God, unfruitful to the kingdom, and we'll go to a, a, a grave having nothing to write on the headstone. We must avoid allowing the world to shape our minds. Be no longer conformed to the world. And this can only be done. We can only cease to be conformed by the world when we embrace the second step of Romans 12 too. And that is to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transform, transformed. I don't like my old way of life. It's dead, I'm born again. But every now and then I, I find myself at odds with myself because I'm, position, I'm, I'm positionally transformed, but the condition of my life doesn't say the same. Transform gives us our English word metamorphosis, which literally is the process that leads to an outward and permanent change. This is the change. This is the transformation that God wants in each of his children. Again, let me remind you, we are no longer babes in Christ, ignorant of God's word. We're no longer just trying to change our behavior to be acceptable by society, but we are being transformed by the renewing of our mind to become Christ-like. And the reason I emphasize that is because many churches, many pastors, many leaders have led people to, to put on good behavior and many of those people do not even know Christ as Savior and Lord or know him as Savior, but only go to him when they need something from him. And God is not trying to make a bunch of simply good behaving people. He's, when he saved you, when he shed his blood, he's redeeming us, redeem us to buy back what we lost. What do we lose? his image and likeness in the garden. We lost the image and likeness of God and God is redeeming back the image and likeness of him in Christ Jesus by renewing our mind, our inner man, our inner man. And the mind is so powerful that if you trace it back to, to Genesis, it was in, it was the mind, it was the battlefield of the mind that caused Eve to be deceived and Adam to be disobedient. Did God really say thou shalt not, re thou shalt surely die? Playing with the mind. But when the mind of Christ permeates, guides, controls, leads, influences, the child of God, you don't walk in doubt. You don't walk in second guessing. You're not double-minded. You're not unstable in all your ways. When you have a mind of Christ, you know who you are, you discern the word of God, and you walk in righteousness and in holiness. God wants to transform the mind of us the soulless part of man, so that the flesh can be changed. 
we must remember uh, that, that the flesh will do what the mind tells it to do. The flesh will do what the mind tells it to do. It's only when the mind is changed, excuse me, and brought under the power of God in Christ's likeness that the flesh can be brought under control. Are y'all there with me? Are you with me today? I wanna know if you're with me. So, so, so we must, one, be no longer molded by the world system. But then two, we must be transformed by the renewing of our mind. How? Oh, that's always the question. How? How is this accomplished? How, how is this accomplished? What must we do to let this mind be in us which was also in Christ Jesus. I want to try to answer that question as we rush to a close. Transformation is brought about by renewing the mind. To renew the mind literally means to reprogram the mind to reprogram our minds to think in alignment with the thoughts of Christ. To reprogram our minds to think, operate in alignment with the thoughts of Christ. To reprogram our minds, we need to do at least four things, four things. We, number one, we must recognize that we have the mind of Christ. Let me say that again. Number one, if you are a child of God, we must recognize and accept the divine truth that we have the mind of Christ. First Corinthians 2.16 tells us we have the mind of Christ. The child of God, you and I, have the capacity to think as Christ thinks. We have the capacity to think as God Christ thinks, to imagine, to reason, to plan, to purpose, to intend. We have the, the capacity, we, the capacity, the potential is within us. Believers cannot claim they are without the ability to live with the mind of Christ. Because the Bible says we have the mind of Christ. However, you know, it's, it's, it's funny because when I went in the military, on the first or second day of basic training, probably the first day, we went through something called general issue. And in general issue, General issue, they gave me everything I needed. Everything I needed for basic training on day one. Everything I needed was given to me, issued to me as a government issue, as a GI. It was given to me on day one. I had everything I needed for the next eight weeks but I didn't know how to use it. So I had to go through training to utilize effectively what I already possessed. So if you and I are gonna have the mind of Christ or gonna walk effectively and exercise the power of the Christian mind, my brother and my sister, the first thing you have to understand is that you already have the mind. Of Christ. The second thing to reprogram our thinking is what we tried to talk about last week is number two, we must choose to think like Christ. Life is about choices. Life is about choices. We, you, I, 
every child of God, if we're going to become Christ-like by being transformed, by being renewed or reprogrammed in our mind, we have to make a choice to think like Christ. Colossians 3, 2, and the Amplified says, set your mind, set your mind, set your mind, set your mind. And, and the Amplified says, and keep focusing habitually. Keep focusing on the things above, the heavenly things, the heavenly perspective, the kingdom mindset, and not on the things of the earth, which have only temporal value. We must have an eternal perspective, but we have to make a choice to keep focus in this text, to set our mind in this text. It's not a one-time deal. It's a choice that we must make and we must make it at all times and in every situation. And this is where the battle is. This is where the battle is waged. It's a spiritual warfare to keep my mind on the things, the attributes and the attitudes of Christ. It's a choice. All of life is about choices. You can choose to focus on the negatives of this world or choose to center your thinking on what is true, what is noble, what is just, what is pure, what is holy, what is of good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, I must choose to think on these things. Not only, not only, not only must we understand we possess the mind of Christ. Secondly, must we make a choice to think like Christ. Here's another challenge. Number three, the, 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 in, in the steps of reprogramming or renewing our mind is three, we must filter our thoughts through the word of God and make them obedient to the will of God. We must filter our thoughts, try our thoughts, filter our thoughts through the word of God and make them obedient to the will of God. What does the word of God say about what I'm thinking? We must take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. The word in that text is every thought, not some thoughts, but every thought. Even when you're thinking something you, we may perceive as being good, is it in the will and the word of God? We must think about what we're thinking about and filter it through the word of God and make it obedient to the will of God. When necessary, we are to redirect our thinking. Revelation, illumination, memorization, and meditation on the word of God empowers us to effectively filter our thoughts through the word of God. Fourthly, finally, we must guard the gates to our minds. Guard your hearts, guard the gates to our minds. We cannot listen to everything and everybody. You cannot look at everything. You cannot hang out with everybody. If your attitude is gonna take you to a new altitude, you gotta check out your associations. Sometimes we have to walk away. Sometimes we have to turn the channel. Sometimes we have to delete the account. Sometimes we have to unfriend Whatever is necessary, we must guard our hearts, guard the gates, your ears, your eyes. Can't even touch everything. Guard it, guard it. We must guard our hearts for out of it flows the issues of life. The Christian mind is only as powerful as it is submitted to the Lordship of Christ. The mind of Christ, the mind of Christ is a mind of sacrifice. The mind of Christ is a mind of discipline. 
The mind of Christ is a mind of humility. The mind of Christ is a mind of obedience. Romans 12, 2. Again, as we close, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God does not want us just to be Baptists, does not want us to just to be church goers, does not want us just to be occupants of heaven. But God's desire for us is to be Christ-like, to become like Christ. And we can only do that by being transformed by the renewing of our minds, by the word and the spirit of God, we are transformed into Christ-likeness when we make the choice to live as God desires. God bless you, my brothers and my sisters. I thank you for giving me this opportunity to come into your homes and hopefully into your hearts and minds. And we pray that we stay connected to God and connected to one another. If you don't know Christ in the pardon of your sins, if you don't know Christ in the pardon of your sins, I encourage you right now to open your heart, to open your heart and allow the Lord Jesus to come into your lives. I encourage you right now. I encourage you to give your life to Christ. How do I do that? How do I do that? I literally just admit that I'm a sinner and believe that God loved me so much that he sent his son to die for me. But he rose again from the dead. And I just ask him to give me eternal life through Jesus Christ. We love you. We thank God for you. And we look forward to walking this great walk of faith with you. The Victory Mass is showing back up again. And we're going to let the Victory Mass close us out. God bless you all. I pray that you all have a great great, great day. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. God bless you all.